welcome back to Candidate Focus. I'm your host, Michael Covington, and I have with me Brian Goldberg. And Brian is running for State House District 18, yeah. Tennessee State Legislature. Welcome to the program, Brian. Thank you so much for having me here. Now, Brian, uh, before I even ask you why you're running, tell, tell the, the viewers and the voters a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, like you said, I'm, I'm Brian Goldberg. Um, I've been in Knoxville since 2002. I came up here on a swimming scholarship to the University of Tennessee. Captained the swim team. I had the honor of being on the U.S. national team during my time at UT. And after I graduated, I made the choice to stay in Knox County and be a Knoxvillian. Uh, started a business in 2010 with Belfort Property Restoration. Met a lovely lady. Somehow convinced her to be my wife. We have two lovely kids and uh, we live at Cedar Bluff. And I walk my kids uh, every day to City Bluff Elementary. It's a highlight of my day. Very good. Brian, that's a good story. You have a good, solid background. Um, you're an entrepreneur. Um, State House District 18, you're challenging uh, the incumbent. Mm -hmm. um, why are you running? Uh, I got the, the call to run both internally and from people in the district about a year ago. After the last session um, at the time, Came out of, uh, I think, personally, the disaster of uh, trying to uh, kick three people out of the legislature. They were successful on two. Um, I think people were embarrassed, honestly, across the state and across the nation. People felt bad for Tennesseans. I think we can hold ourselves to a higher discourse standard. Uh, the legislation coming out of our uh, General Assembly, I think, is not representative of the average Tennessean anymore. And um, I got tired of sitting on the sidelines and complaining and said, if I if I complain anymore, nobody's going to listen to me. So I might as well throw my hat into the ring and uh, provide uh, people a different perspective of what a, a representative can be and decide to get in the game instead of just sitting on the sidelines. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's, uh, let's explore the, the situation with the, uh, with the legislators that um, were proposed for expulsion. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the, the, the bullhorn that the two two gentlemen had. Are, are you in support of how they handled that or are you just displeased with how the state house majority responded to it? Well I agree that the house has a responsibility to set up its own rules of decorum mm -hmm. and I think that they're, they're set up for a reason to, to be respectful of everybody's position um, and you know while you know to the letter of those rules that Bullhorn might have uh, not met the standards of the, the house decorum I think that it was indi indicative of what the public was feeling and experiencing after the Covenant shooting. And there's a lot of different options that the, the speaker could have, could have imposed, um, just an enormous amount of other options. And I think that the way that they handled it and the supermajority handled it was just disgraceful. Okay. You're, by all accounts, you're a star athlete. Okay. You were a star athlete on, yeah. the, on the U.S. national team. Okay. Swimming, um, uh, an art form sport. Uh, you've got to have form. You've got to have skill. The star players always rise to the top. The ones that are not so, not so uh, effective in competition tend to be near the end of the bench, so to speak. When you go to Nashville as a representative for District 18, you're going to be that guy at the end of the bench. You're going to be that guy that doesn't get in the ball game you may not be allowed to get behind the mic in the first two years you're in Nashville just based on how the supermajority does business. How do you feel about being there in service of your district but not being recognized, not, not even being acknowledged uh, just based on the strength of the supermajority? How, do you, how, how would you function in that environment? Um, you know, that's, that's the reality, honestly, about what what I would be facing. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a good thing to just be honest about that. And, and people ask me, you know, what are the legislative uh, outcomes you want? What are the bills that you want to pass? And, and I basically give them that. I, if elected, we're still in the super minority position. Um, and I think what sets me apart is that, you know, I'm not going to be there to be a performative politician. I want to represent the 18th um, effectively and aggressively. Well, what's good for the district should be bipartisan. I mean, there's bills that will come up that are strictly partisan and do uh, from time to time. And where I can support um, legislation uh, in a bipartisan manner, you're going to hear my voice very loud, especially when it benefits the 18th. Um, but where 
I can't support legislation, you're also going to hear uh, clear reasons why, and you're going to have an open email and a phone if you're a, a citizen of the 18th to uh, let me hear what your thoughts are. And I think that that's uh, the difference between me and what is being offered in my opponent right now. But um, if we don't, you know, if, if we don't start making it a two-party system, right? I mean, the Democrats could walk out tomorrow and the Republicans would still be able to run business. Mm -hmm. And that is not a way to hear both sides of an equation or give the minority any ability to respectfully bring their opinions to the table. If we don't start winning a couple of these seats back and bringing some moderation to the House floor, um, I just don't think that the, the voices of the average Tennesseans are going to continue being, being able to be heard. Okay. Your opponent, um, the incumbent, uh, this may be her third term, maybe, maybe her third term, but certainly, um, in, when she ran for this seat the very first time, one of the things that you knew about your opponent, even outside of your district, was that she, she really had the door knocking apparatus working, and she headed that operation, as in, she was the person knocking on that door, and she generally had knowledgeable and recognizable people with her. So she had a strong, strong uh, personal approach to campaigning, and she has probably uh, redone that and, and is doing that again. So she's, uh, she is known within the district, and she has had some success in the legislature. How would you counter her ability to get out and be face-to-face -face with voters? Sure. Well, let's go back. I'm a former U.S. national athlete, and I'm a swimmer. Um, it's about the only sport where you can work uh, eight hours a day, six hours a day for six, nine months at a time for, for a minute and 48 second recognition. And to be able to put in all that hard work for such a short amount of gratitude is part of who I am in my core. Okay. I am not going to be outworked. Okay. And I'm going to try to do my very best to meet every voter. Uh, whether at a public event where I'm currently at, many of them, or at their doorsteps, or, or at their places of business, or at their community centers. Um, I, I promise you that I won't be out work because I know how to do it. Um, and I know my opponent is out there knocking on doors as well. Um, and I say let the best person win. I, I'm bringing my vision. Um, I've got a pretty good idea of what I want to do and, and what my issues are. And I'd, I'd, like, to see, uh, I'd like to see that public discourse be uh, healthy uh, and out there. Okay. Uh, Brian, uh, one of the things that you would face Let's just go ahead and put you in the seat. Now you're in Nashville. Um, there are, just, just from the wonky observers like myself who try to follow what goes on in Nashville as it relates to the more prominent um, um, legislative initiatives that are being bantered around. Um, when, you go, when you go to the, your first session, vouchers will resurface. It failed in this legislative session, but it's gonna come back and it'll be stronger. That push will be stronger next time around. How do you stand? What is your position on school vouchers? Yeah, I think my position on school vouchers is going to be very, very clear. I am against school vouchers because I'm for public school funding. I don't think we, we fund our public schools at the levels that we should to get the results that we want, mm -hmm. right? We can't say we want the best and then fund it at a level that won't produce the best. And currently, the, the voucher conversation, I think, has a complete lack of conversation surrounding what we can do for public schools. Mm -hmm. So when I get there and that voucher push happens again, and I believe you are correct, it will uh, come again, I, I'm going to be representative of the 18th district. I'm going to sit down with the school board members, I'm going to sit down with the superintendent and listen to what the district wants. And I don't believe that the 18th district is, uh, is it really wants vouchers at all. And I think part of being a representative is representing your district. And so I will stand against school vouchers, but more importantly, I'm going to fight for public schools. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to the other hot button issue. And the legislature has failed miserably uh, in addressing what the citizens of the state of Tennessee want, which is uh, some form of very effective uh, legislation that could potentially curb deadly violence from guns. Yeah. And uh, it just has not gotten done even in special session, that, that was just uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars just wasted. Uh, how do you feel about trying to move good faith legislation forward 
And would you favor the release of the uh, Covenant Shooters manifesto if it would curb violence, if it would get legislation passed? Um, I don't think that there's anything that needs to be added to the public discourse to convince uh, legislatures that the public wants what the public wants, which is common sense, you know, gun laws that will curb violence. I, if we're waiting around for that manifesto to come out to say, hey, that's the, that's the straw that broke the camel's back, we're being disingenuous with ourselves. There's plenty of statistics, there's data out there, there's people that are not being heard that have suffered family violence, personal violence, lost kids, lost family members, lost friends from gun violence. All we need to do is listen to each other. And all we need to do is be, once again, representative of the ten uh, people of the state of Tennessee. Um, I think that there's movement. I think there's quiet movement um, to pull back some of the more ridiculous laws that have been passed over the last many sessions from the legislature that have done nothing to address gun violence but has done everything to just further expand um, Second Amendment rights to, to the point where it's almost an unlimited uh, ability to have a gun, carry gun wherever, with with very few restrictions. And I go back to the to the to the founding of the country and the word uh, of the Second Amendment, which is well regulated militia, right? I mean, well regulated. I think we've forgotten that that's part of the sentence. Well regulated. I mean, I, I stand for just requiring. It's a basic, common sense requirement to if you're going to have a handgun or a gun outside of your house and you're going to choose to carry it with you to protect your family or whatever. I'd like you to step up to the plate and be required to pass um, a permitting so, process. Okay, let's let's jump into while we've got uh, a little bit more time, um, the testing uh, that that the legislature has mandated happen for third graders. Yeah. To go into fourth grade, just just give me your your general impression of that. My impression was that that testing was. Uh, uh, there was reasoning behind that testing, and I think it was to create a narrative that justified vouchers. I couldn't be any more clear. First person to, to actually say that. Let's let's make sure we're clear on that. You think that the the legislation on reading for for young people in third grade is tied to vouchers? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I think it plays into a narrative and justifies a narrative that they already wanted to create, mm -hmm. which said our public schools are failing. Look at all these third graders that can't read or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need vouchers. I can say, Brian, you're the very first candidate to even broach the subject in that way. So, so that's interesting. I'll have to give that some thought. We've got just over a minute left, and we talked about this. I want you to have an opportunity, given that you're a first-time candidate, not particularly well know, known in political circles, though mm -hmm. the VFLs of, uh, of this, <laughs> this, this area know you well, I would imagine. But just look right into the camera and tell the voters why they should vote for Brian Goldberg in this election. Sure, and thanks for that opportunity. Listen, this election in November is gonna be pivotal, for, not only for our state, but for our country. We have a chance to step up and affect some real change, bring back some moderation to our state, and I, I stand ready to be that candidate for the 18th district. I encourage everybody to check me out. Just do a web search, Brian Goldberg in Knoxville, Tennessee. I have a long history of community involvement. I have a long history of standing up for people and representing them. And I can promise you this, above anything else, I'm not going to agree with every issue, with every single person every, every bit of the time. Nobody agrees with anybody 100% of the time, but I'll always be able to be reached by phone or email and hear you out and be able to represent you because I desperately want to be representative of the 18th district. This isn't about me, this is about you and all of us and affecting some positive change. Thank you so much. Brian Goldberg, candidate for State House District 18, I wish you the very best. Thank you very much for having me again.